There, it's so interesting to me because so many of the intersections this morning uh, between health, between energy, come down to what I'm going to be talking about a little bit today, which is water. Uh, so we've heard about the, you know, the seven billion people on Earth, right, and the billion of them who don't have access to clean water. And, you know, I think of these people, since 2000, I've been an independent reporter working mostly in Africa and Asia. And, you know, I've seen women and children lining up for days for water. Recently in Afghanistan, I was covering a murder over control of a water pump in a refugee camp. I mean, these are very real pressing issues in most of the world. And I don't think of them in terms of America. At least I didn't until a couple of years ago I met Shelley Palin. Now, Shelley is, Shelley actually would be a perfect person, Layla, for the microclinic program. She works in healthcare. She's diabetic. Um, she is a wild beekeeper. She, she makes her own moonshine, which I'm not sure she's going to love that I just said on camera, but that's OK. <laughs> uh, she makes propolis. I mean, she is just on it. She's constantly, she's an entrepreneur. Um, and she also, what she also likes to do is raise baby raccoons. This is a completely manipulative photo that has nothing to do with Shelly, but I thought I'd win you over with a baby raccoon photo stolen from the internet. Actually, legally, legally claimed from the internet. So, so she gets these raccoons from basically their, their mothers are roadkill. And, uh, so she, because she lives on what's the National Highway, which is a more than 200-year-old road stretching from, really, from Philadelphia west, and the trucks go by her house every day. And so she'll go and find one baby raccoon left from the, from the dead mom. And the trucks that go by mostly are water trucks. And those water trucks are headed mostly to natural gas wells in her town of Amity, Pennsylvania. Uh, so here she is living in one of the most water-rich areas of the world. She doesn't live in Africa. She doesn't live in Afghanistan. She lives, she lives in Appalachia. It, she lives an hour southwest of Pittsburgh in what's Pittsburgh's called the Paris of Appalachia. And uh, so she lives in this extremely water-rich area with more rainy days in a year than Seattle. And yet, she doesn't have access to water. So I thought I would read, she's extremely eloquent, and she would be, do a better job than I would of explaining her plight. So here's an email she wrote me a couple of weeks ago. Every Saturday at 5 AM, my family gets up to haul water. I'm watching the fifth generation struggle. Every time I watch my kids haul it from Rough Creek Pump Station in nearby Prosperity <clears throat> and dump it into a hand dug well that runs off of a spring, that comes from the great Marcellus land that we have in Pennsylvania. So that's what life is like for Shelley. And that is her bathtub. Why? Because she has no water. Um, OK, so how it works for Shelley is there's a creek. They call it a crick uh, just outside of her house. And she and her parents and everybody else for the past 200 years have not had any running water at all. She grew up with access to a giant cistern, which she and her sister used to fight over who could shave their legs in the, in the rainwater. Uh, but that's it. And water is not coming. She bought this bathtub because it was super cheap at a discount auction. And she got excited about it. And she thought that she would be getting water soon. Um, but she didn't. And she was so frustrated that Shelley walked door to door to get a petition signed so that everybody in this little town of Amity could have water. Well. What happened, they did get water. But the tap-in fee was $900 for a household to get water. And every family, including Shelley's, has to pay about $20 a, a month because the town didn't even have enough money to install the pipes. And the water authority made them pay for the pipes themselves, which is understandable. They're, they have to turn a profit. So now, so Shelley, although she organized for the entire town to have water, she never got it herself because they couldn't afford the $900, and now it's $1,200. So what, what's going on here? What, what is the, if there's, if water, we think about water in terms of scarcity, like what's our global water problem? There's not enough of it. It's a dwindling resource. Uh, you know, people don't have access to it for that reason. 
Well, there's another reason, which has to do with the system that delivers it. And that's really the most yawn-producing word, which I have struggled to pep up for years, which is our infrastructure, right? America's lifeline systems, our grid, our water system, um, really, our roads, our bridges. Obama, the other night, 70,000 structurally deficient bridges. Maybe some of us saw The Daily Show make fun of that because it was so boring, but it's important, right? So how do we deal with the fact that America's lifeline systems are crumbling under our feet, right? Okay, so these systems were built basically from the 1930s to the 60s. They were, a lot of them were built d under the WPA, right? Why then? Why did Roosevelt target infrastructure? Well, partly because labor was cheap and so were materials, not, like, not unlike today. Okay, so then through the 60s, <coughs> there was this big boom as well, uh, basically until the end of Eisenhower, and we had these great systems, which we have not maintained. So today, our water infrastructure system, the American Society of Civil Engineers last year gave it a D minus. So what makes our water, our water isn't qualitatively so different from Africa's, right? It's not like we've got great water and Africa has terrible water and that's why you know, more than three million people die of water-related diseases a year. No, that's not what makes it different. What makes our water different because we have the same parasites, we have a lot of the same problems with our water, is treatment. It is this system that is currently breaking down around us. So technically, those systems were built to last between 50 to 75 years, which was the best we could do from 1930 to 1960. So technically, those systems are now dead. So one of the reasons that I am interested in this is because I'm really interested in looking at how do we tell the story of our collective poverty, right? I mean, it's easy to look at pictures of, of people in the inner city, look at that isolated story, look at an isolated story of somebody like Shelley living in Appalachia. But how do we understand what is the common system that we all share that, that isn't sustaining us, that we're not paying into, that, that we have not maintained? What does the face of that look like? And it looks like crumbling pipes. Now, I came to this story myself actually working in Nigeria. It was 2008. Uh, I was in a little town in northern Nigeria where a bridge had collapsed, and 47 people were killed. And it was right after the bridge. It was two weeks after the bridge in Minneapolis had collapsed. And I was sitting by the side of a road thinking, you know, I don't really have to travel 6,000 miles to watch a bridge collapse anymore. This is happening in America all around us. And one of the greatest disparities is that in this community of Amity, what you're looking at there is a, that's water being piped, and that's water being piped for natural gas drilling, hydraulic fracturing, uh, which basically entails dumping about four million gallons of water, or pumping that water into the earth, along with sand and chemicals, and that that water goes down in you know now many miles. Uh, into the shale, into the shale rock, and it cracks the rock, goes out laterally, it cracks the rock, and it frees bubbles of natural gas in the rock, and then everything comes back up. Uh, the, the water with the chemicals in it, radioactive materials from the, fr that were under the earth, which in fact may be more problematic than the, than the chemicals we're putting in the earth, um, and of course the natural gas. Now not all of it comes back up, but dealing with that wastewater is a major issue. It's a major issue in Amity, Pennsylvania. And so right now there's a really hot fight going on about wh what do you do with this water? You have to truck it to Ohio. You can put it in a massive pond that's exposed to the air. That's very problematic and controversial. This is an ongoing fight. And in fact, the issue of water goes far, far beyond fracking. And that's why I really wanted to talk about it today because I didn't even understand this little town didn't have water and hadn't for 200 years until I started getting into the issue of water around fracking. And for example, it's so intense that, uh, st that Shelley's sister, Stacy, bought a house with water in order to supply that water to the church because nobody in town has any water at all. And and they haven't since what happened is in the 1770s, five brothers called the Bain brothers moved to Amity. They 
they drilled a single well, and uh, then the well dried up. And since then, it's been either too expensive, some of the water is bad, uh, for people to drill their own wells. So, okay. So beyond fracking, how do, how do we look at the issue of water? Um, and there are people in Amity and the nearby town of Prosperity who love fracking, who think it's the answer in communities where farming hasn't paid, doesn't pay, isn't going to pay. There are people who believe that fracking is poisoning their rivers and streams and sickening their kids. Th there are larger issues here. This is an ongoing fight. Okay, so how are we going to solve this problem? What are we going to do to address the lack of water in Amity and the fact that these 10,000 gallon water trucks go by Shelley's house every day? Washington clearly is not in a position to help in Amity, Pennsylvania, because Washington is broke. So the answer is going to lie to some degree. This is runoff from a frack pond. The answer is, this is my assistant Annabelle's fo favorite photo, so I let her put it in. <laughs> so, um, Another favorite of hers. Funny, <laughs> bad road. So, so where are we gonna? How are we gonna solve problems like our terrible roads? Well, Obama did mention it the other night, just in passing, this idea of public-private partnerships. Um, we are gonna have to see the public and and private interests come together in some ways. And my modest proposal for how that could work uh, in Amity is this. So when a gas company comes to town. What they do is they bond out the roads, right? They, they make sure that whatever their, their trucks that are carrying water and materials are definitely going to wreck little country roads. And they take care of that right up front. They say to both the state and the local authorities, we're going to pay. And you know what? In a lot of cases, they've actually improved the roads. Um, so yes, people have complaints while they're coming through diesel fumes, their roads are ruined, potholes, the cost on their cars of that process. But five years on, you've got Macadam, you've got, you've got a blacktop road where you used to have a country road. So there are improvements that happen in that way. Well, why can't they happen with water too? When a gas company comes to town, why can't they make sure that the rights and the, basically the rights to the commons, right, that, that these people have had, they have the water. They don't have access to the water. So the gas companies are using a 21st century technology. Why can't they help in, the, in their own pursuit of water, which they need for their process, why can't they help bring the local community out of the 1770s? So I think it's possible. Um, I think it's a community solution that we could see in pilot programs. And uh, that's what I have for you today. Thank you.